Good evening. Thank you for joining us for another of our TeleArtworks online lectures. Before we begin, I should like to give you some information about the Atelier at Flower Field, a 5013C not-for-profit organization. Our spring four session is in session and our summer session starts uh, the week of July 11th. Uh, classes are online, open for registration. We offer a variety of fine art drawing and painting classes in a variety of mediums, both online and in studio. We also offer classes in illustration and digital painting. And we have a variety of paintings on sale in our art, online art shop. Details can be found on our website, atelierflowerfield.org. Our next exhibition will be our student instructor show, which opens on July 7th. Uh, the opening reception will be from 5.30 to 7.30 and all are welcome. The gallery is open nine to five Monday through Saturday. Uh, I'd also like to uh, give uh, everyone a, just a, a heads up that we have a, a new three-day workshop uh, with a new instructor, Robert Rosenberg, who will be um, teaching comic and character design. So this is comic book and character design uh, over three days. Uh, each session is two hours. Um, details again can be found on our website. Tonight, our instructor, James Beale, is presenting a lecture demonstration on painting Dungeons and Dragons. We welcome him this evening and hope you enjoy tonight's demonstration. And if you wish to ask questions, please post them in the chat room. I shall now hand over to James. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet everybody. My name is James. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank the Atelier for putting this on. Um, we did a fantastic uh, lecture last summer on the artist Sid Mead, and that was more science fiction in terms of looking at genre art more geared towards sci-fi than fantasy. And that's a fantastic uh, lecture if you want to check it out. It's on, I believe the Atelier should have a recording of that lecture as well. And I also have it posted to my YouTube channel, which I'll, I'll throw in the chat later on in the lecture. Um, I'll plug myself there. <laughs> but um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you tonight. And uh, yeah, just wanted to give that special thanks to the Atelier and to the board for making all this possible. Um, it's great to be back for another summer lecture series event. So Dungeons and Dragons, um, my exposure to Dungeons and Dragons was um, primarily through the uh, Dragonlance uh, universe, which uh, spawned modules, novels, um, uh, you know, and uh, toys, and a bunch of other ancillary material. And um, I didn't know that Dragonlance was part of Dungeons and Dragons actually um, until I did some further research later on when I, you know, when I got more into the books and I found out it's part of D and D, and that was sort of my gateway into D and D. So um, I want to give a little bit of a history of the of TSR, uh, the company, the founders, um, their impact on fantasy art, and um, the things that influenced the development of Dungeons and Dragons, um, mainly Tolkien, which a lot of people may or may not know. Um, Tolkien was a huge uh, influence on Dungeons and Dragons, and it was very controversial because the Tolkien estate at the time that uh, TSR published the, the first few editions uh, sued, sued the company. And um, yeah, that, that, that's, I did not know that. I, doing my research for this lecture, I, I was surprised to come across that. But then again, not super surprised because there's halflings, which are hobbits. And there's a lot of crossover if you play the game or are familiar with the D&D universe. So I just wanted to um, come at this from my perspective since going off my experience with the, with, you know, with Dungeons and Dragons is mainly limited to the Dragonlance universe. That's going to be sort of our entryway into the larger uh, world of D&D tonight. And um, event in a few in a little bit, I'm going to play a pre-recorded oil painting demo in which I paint a complete uh, dragon done in the style of a classic, you know, that classic retro uh, D and D high fantasy painting style. Um, and uh, I take you through the whole process from soup to nuts: how I start a painting, how I block you know, the shapes and values in. Um, there's a little bit of me designing one of the heroes in the foreground, but then we quickly dive into the, the face of the dragon in my painting. And then you'll get to see exactly how I start out, and then you'll see what it looks like when it's done, that section of my of my painting. It's a big painting, so I just focused on the dragon, the, the part of the, the snout of the dragon um, for, this, for this lecture tonight. 
Um, but with that said, what I want to do is look at some of the artists uh, that will be go that will spotlight here. If anybody has any questions in the chat or wants to tell me who their favorite Dungeons and Dragons artists are, then go for it. And we're just going to look at some art here that I have popped up and right away. And again, uh, a lot of the artists that influenced me came from were born in mid 60s, early 70s. And they were sort of like that third or fourth generation of Dungeons and Dragon art, Dra Dungeons and Dragons artist. So we're talking Matt Stawicki, Todd Lockwood, and Gerald Brom in particular were big influences on me. This is some examples of Brom's work, sort of very known for painting, you know, beautiful women, uh, sort of in the vein of Frank Frazetta, who was a legendary fantasy artist who was a big influence on him. Um, you can see here, this looks like a Conan piece, um, but also very famous, not only for Dungeons and Dragons, but later on for Magic the Gathering. And he actually started at the very end of the 1980s. And he did the, I think it was the module Dark Sun was the name of the module. Um, and again, uh, I had to do a little bit of research on the larger D&D universe proper outside of Dragonlance. And this does look like it was uh, done for Dark Sun. You can see just warriors, this is Ken Kelly, who actually did some album art. Ken Kelly was a, uh, he did a lot of heavy metal. He worked for a lot of heavy metal bands. Um, another artist that I didn't, I didn't really look, I look into profiling, but now that we're on his art, I should mention him. Sort of another uh, artist that was very inf influenced by Frank Frazetta and will spotlight Frazetta as well. If you're unfamiliar with the artist Frank Frazetta, he's one of the most influential illustrators of the 20th century. This is another Ken Kelly piece. You can see very sort of just uh, Robert E. Howard, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, all those authors use these artists. Yeah, I think Ken Kelly was probably, I think I would imagine Brahm and Ken Kelly were aware of each other, or Brahm was definitely aware of Ken Kelly, that he was a big influence on Brahm's art. Getting back to Brahm, this is some more of his work. Very sort of earthy, moody, dark colors. Um, and I remember being a kid playing Magic the Gathering. I really loved his work. It's a little pixelated, but that's one of his pieces. You could, a lot of really earthy reds, um, paints pretty dirty. And that's another thing you want to do if you're, especially with oil painting, but any kind of painting is paint dirty, right? And he's clearly doing that here, going for sort of that high real, I would say like a stylized imaginative realism, but he definitely could paint high realism if you wanted to. Definitely a little more stylized. This is another piece by Brahm. I love the sort of contrast between warm and cool in this. Although the whole piece tends to skew a little warm, there's a, a nice contrast of values in this piece. Another great Brahm piece. So let's look at a few more. And if anybody has any other artists that they like that they wanna, again, don't be afraid to use that chat, right? If you have an artist that you'd like us to look at, feel free to uh, put your two cents in there. If we have any D&D &D fans, any historians, this is also Gerald Brom. He worked on, um, I have some notes here on Brom. He started at, again, at TSR. He started uh, on the module Dark Sun in the early 90s. And uh, he actually was the first artist that an entire module was designed around. So he did the entire uh, Dark Sun module by himself, which was atypical up until that point. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons artists had shared art duties on on modules. There wasn't a unified look, but this was around the time when the art direction at TSR started to take more of a of a heavy handed role in terms of they wanted each module or each edition to have a unified aesthetic. So you, this looks like actually maybe some of his earlier work, but I could be. There's no date on that, but that's an interesting image. And then. Uh, Again, Brahm was born in 65. So this was a guy, when I was a young kid, he was, he was in like the prime of, you know, just past the middle of the beginning of his career, sort of going into the prime of his career. And I discovered him actually through Magic the Gathering. And that was around the same time that the company that owned Magic, Wizards of the Coast, acquired TSR, which produces Dungeons and Dragons. And that happened back in 1997. And that's when I was playing Magic, which gives you an idea of how old I am. That's a picture of him right there. Nice three-fourths lighting. He did, looks like he did, he also did science fiction. Some very spooky, very dark, moody. Definitely as a kid, I've responded, you know, looking at this artwork now, I think my tastes have definitely shifted a little bit 
um, I think, or something that struck a chord with me as a kid at that age, just the darkness and moodiness of it. I would say that um, his color palette in particular, I wouldn't be surprised if he uses a very limited palette. I know I, for myself, I use something called the Zorn palette, which is a four color palette. And that is uh, yellow ochre. I do yellow ochre, ivory black. It's alizarin crimson, but I switch out, or no, vermilion. I switch out the vermilion for cadmium red. Yeah, so yellow, ochre, ivory black, cadmium red, and white. And then I use cobalt blue as a supplement. So that is my modified limited palette. Sort of a, it's a Zorn palette plus, Zorn palette 1.5, we'll call it, I guess. But I imagine he used a similar color palette for a lot of this stuff. It looks very earth tony. Oh, yes, he did the artwork for Doom, for those of you who were nostalgic for that time period in video games. So this was, I didn't realize he did this cover, but again, this was the kind of art, speaking from my own perspective, when I was a kid growing up, I ate all of this art up. <laughs> so this was an image that was burned into my brain as a 10-year-old. Yes, yes, yes. It is amazing. I mean, and again, I knew I... I grew up with these images, but I didn't, I didn't know he in particular did this. I was familiar. He did, um, as far as Magic the Gathering, Brahm did, um, what was it? He uh, did Mirage, which came out in, I think, 94. Tempest, which was the uh, sort of like a dark, sort of similar to Dark Suns and Dungeons and Dragons. It took place in this dark sort of apocalyptic world. And, you know, everything was kind of twisted and dark. Think like Mordor, like the setting was like a Mordor-like plane. So he did Tempest in 97, Mirage in 94, and he did Ice Age, which I think came out either in 95 or 96. Um, those, were the, those were the game, the Magic editions that I played. I kind of fell off of it after Tempest. Ooh, a couple more, and then we'll switch to some other artists here. that uh, uh, We have Brahm, and then next in line, we have Keith Parkinson. And now, before I go on, I should actually recap some of the history of D&D. &D. So Dungeons and Dragons was originally designed, the game uh, was designed by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, and it was first published in 1974 by Tactical Studies Rules, or TSR. And growing up, I always wondered what TSR stood for, and now I know. <laughs> so that's Keith's work. We'll look at some of Keith's work here. And uh, basically, for those of you who are not familiar at all with Dungeons and Dragons, it's a tabletop game in which players are encouraged to use their imagination. It's a role-playing game where you assume the identity of a customizable fantasy character and um, go through a narrative that's determined by you and the other players, along with a, a, an individual called the Dungeon Master, who is sort of the Game Master. And you can see P Keith Parkinson is actually widely regarded in his generation of the TSR artists that came to prominence in the early 80s as one of the best draftsmen out of the three main artists that we'll be looking at uh, today in that group. And those artists are the artists that came out that, that really elevated TSR in terms of the output that they were producing in the early 80s were uh, Larry Elmore, Keith Parkinson, and Clyde Caldwell. Before the, those three artists were hired by TSR, uh, primarily uh, TSR had used staff artists and they were, they were, they were all, there were a lot of really talented artists uh, that came on in the inception of the first editions of Dungeons and Dragons. But uh, those three, these three artists that came on in the early eighties were just operating at another level and really elevated the, 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 the field of fantasy art into what it would eventually grow into. They took the idea of fantasy art and followed in the traditions of artists like Frank Frazetta and the pre-Raphaelites, if you wanna really um, go back into uh, into producing something that was they going from producing more lighthearted material to what in a sense was high art. Keith Parkinson also worked on Sword of Truth by Terry Goodkind. There's a I think that's Wizards First Rule cover for Wizards were First Rule. Another series of books by by a very controversial author. <laughs> and honestly, at the time that I read Sword of Truth, I had no idea of what um, Goodkind's politics were or that he was extremely controversial. I was also in my early 20s at that time, and you know, this was at the height of, I think, um, uh, if you're going to talk about Goodkind, you have to talk about what was going on at the time. It was the Iraq War, and uh, Goodkind was a very uh, staunch supporter of the Iraq War. And um, I didn't know any of that, though, when I read him as like a 20-year-old. 
<laughs> I just thought that he had a really cool developed magic system. And I was really interested in the idea of the same with Robert Jordan, these magic systems that, um, let me go back to, I just got off Keith Parkinson there. These magic systems that were based more on laws of physics than you know a soft magic system like Tolkien. Unfortunately, Keith Parkinson passed away. He was born in uh, 1958. Unfortunately, he died of leukemia in 2005. It's extremely sad, but you can see he's very tight, um, extremely controlled, but still has a lot of energy. He was known for his serpentine dragons, his sort of like very snake-like serpentine dragons and just insane levels of detail. That's more of, I think, a fan. I think that might be a fan art, but this is just beautiful. Let's look at this one. Stunning. And definitely reminds me of the pre-Raphaelites. This is a little more sci-fi, but still sort of space fantasy, I suppose. Minions of Legworth. Excellent. And you can see he still has a very a very high, you know, high degree control of value, right? Like his colors are dirty. That's a theme with these guys, is they all paint dirty. If you're trying to paint realism, especially like, you know, high realism, you want to paint dirty. There's shades of gray in. It, that we see that we subconsciously pick up when we look at objects in real life that, you know, you're never just looking at a straight green or a straight red. There's always a ruddiness and a grit to that red or green in real life. And that's something that I see a lot of beginners do that, to be honest, is sort of a mistake is they try to, they preconceive of what that color looks like and they try to just get it to its purest form, which again, doesn't exist. Even pure black, I would argue. And some people probably fight me on this, but like pure black doesn't really exist in real life either unless it's pigment that's made there's like i think a pigment that you can paint your room pure black and it looks ridiculous it looks like someone standing in space i mean but pure black almost never i've, I've never seen it in nature it's always going to skew green and warm or it's going to skew blue right and blue is going to give you cool shadows and green will give you warmer shadows you can also do a red black a red a black that goes brown or red um but i tend to when i I'm doing faces especially i'll either go green or blue with my blacks so you can see just beautiful there's a little bit of frank herbert dune reference uh homage going on in this one it looks like it's just stunning i i mean uh, this must have been some of his later work that looks like it looks like he definitely got better at his faces between this piece and some of his earlier work anytime you get a uh a man interacting with a beast or riding a dinosaur or training a dragon it's always a good or heroin, a hero or heroine, I should say, doing that sort of thing. Those are always interesting pieces. It's a little pixelated, but I like the narrative in this piece. So this is Keith Parkinson again, someone I wasn't really aware of because he was an, an old timer, right? I came in and then, you know, I was looking at guys from when I when I was a kid, the guys that were working were a bit younger, right? They were all Gen Xers, right? So I was like looking at these guys like Brahm and Mastawicki who were about 10 to 15 years older than me. But these guys, those guys were looking at guys like this gentleman, Keith Parkinson, you know, and they were idolizing guys like this. <clears throat> I wasn't even aware existed until I started working and <laughs> going to conventions. And I'm like, wait, so yeah, just stunning levels of control and detail. Um, Almost, you know, to a point, like, you know, opposite of Frazetta. Frazetta is not controlled. And when we get to Frazetta, you'll see. So we've done Brom, we've done Keith. Let's go um, to someone who's on the opposite end of the spectrum, Frank Frazetta. And all these artists in uh, cite this guy as an influence. Frazetta never, I don't think he ever did any Dungeons and Dragons work. He did work for Heavy Metal Magazine. But Frazetta just had such a monumental impact on fantasy art. And a lot of the guys that came into TSR in the early 80s, like Elmore Parkinson, and Clyde Caldwell were, were definitely aware of him, and I would say tangentially influenced by him to one degree or another. But then the people who came in after that group of artists, like the Brahms and the Master Wikis, were influenced even more by Frazetta, I would say. This is Frazetta. When he was still with us, he unfortunately passed away in um, 2010, when I was just getting out of art school, actually. I went to, I went to art school a little bit later. Uh, I went to art school. I was there at Pratt. I was 25 when I went to Pratt and graduated at 30. So I remember I graduated in 2011. He passed away in 2010. That was really, uh, that was tough because he was a big influence on me as well. And you can see the death dealer in the background there, just stunning, stunning work. That's him when he was younger. 
probably using industrial grade turpentine, which is not, oh, not a good thing. <laughs> there was a lot of artists back then were not aware of the health hazards of turpentine. There's Mr. Clint Eastwood himself, the man, the myth, the legend with, it looks like a, I don't know if that's Dirty Harry or what pose, that was for a particular movie that Clint Eastwood starred in. Some po some art from Frazetta that always stuck out at me. This one always, I love the marble, the texture he got and the cat in the foreground on this piece. And just the fact that it's the exotic setting just kind of sp speaks to me. If you wanna talk about fluidity and energy, this piece is just incredible. Let's look at a couple of more. That's an, one I haven't seen before, but just great command of the human figure. Very much like, you know, kind of reminds me of like a modern day Michelangelo, the way he sort of hyper-musculizes the figure, but also there's so much gesture and movement going on that, you know, I wish I could, for speaking for myself, get this level of looseness. I think Frazetta might have done, I don't think he, he, if he did, if he did Al Prima or not, I assume he was working off another drawing, but he might not have been. Sometimes the backgrounds become pea soup, but that's okay because you're not even looking at the background. You're kind of just looking at the figures and just great colors and let's get out of there. So anyway, before we get in the weeds and Frank Rosetta, this is his most famous work, which is sort of a washed out pic picture of it. One of his most famous works was Conan the Barbarian. I don't know why they didn't get him to do the movie posters, but they didn't. Um, I think this is a more accurate colorization of the image. It's got more of a red tint to it. But that's Frazetta, huge influence, was born in, um, born in 1928 in Brooklyn and died in 2010 in Florida. Um, another guy who was very big was Boris Vallejo, he was born in 48 in Peru. And again, kind of known for more women and just a beautiful idealized human figures. Great at drawing faces, but definitely more tight than Frazetta. And definitely had more painted, he painted in a way that um, I looked at a lot of Boris for kind of like honing my own, fine tuning my own painting technique where Boris just paints super thin and he's super confident in his brush strokes. And like, I always like these images here. This is kind of a cool image with the dinosaur and the female, like she looks like she's like CrossFit or something. His wife, Julie Bell, incidentally was a bodybuilder. I think they were both bodybuilders when they were younger. So that's why a lot of the, subjects in their paintings are like, you know, look like bodybuilders. And like, you know, the, why they're so idealized looking is because I think they were in that community and they sort of, that's what sort of spoke to them. But no, they, they definitely were known for just a training, I guess you could say painting conventionally attractive people. So, but some of Boris Vallejo's earlier work from like the seventies and eighties has a little bit more of a painterly look to it. It's a little bit looser. This one in particular, I really like, because this is a good image if you're trying to do a master study or learn on. This is an actually a good Boris image to use because it's it's got some really nice blocked in shapes and values. Some of his later work, he gets very, very he paints. He's painting like not even fat on lean. He's painting lean on lean and he's going really quick and he's getting a lot of glazed, glazed effects. And it's really tough to kind of get in there and figure out what's going on if you haven't been painting for a while. I mean, not Mirage, this... This is another great early work that he did that's pretty good. But you can sell even here, he's getting really a lot of complex, a lot of complexity going on with these values. He's getting the base, basic shapes and blocking in, but he's painting super thin. And I would guess he's painting with a, a sort of mid, mid size to small round and, and or maybe, you know, blocking in with a filbert to get those shapes. I sometimes, and you'll see in my, in my painting demo, I use a Q-tip. It is 729, so what I'm going to do without further ado is I'm going to open up my pre-recorded demo here before I let time get away from me. These, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, these art, artists typically worked in oil, um, but they could work in anything. I think they've worked, a lot of them also graduated to digital after a certain point. So I have a bunch of material that I pre-recorded. had the pleasure of starting a new painting. So let me open this up. So this is actually the thumbnail for my YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, John Art with JB. You're welcome to follow me on there. And this is my my own dungeon, <laughs> incidentally. So starts um, starts out kind of slow, but then I, I increase the speed later on. So I'm zooming in. Right now, the face is not where I want it to be, but uh, you'll see me sort of course correct. Uh, that, that left eye basically is off right now. So I go in, I step away, and I come back, and I kind of correct this left eye. 
you can see I'm just blocking in. And this is uh, what I do is I use Photoshop to create a mock-up of what the painting will ballpark look like. And then I go in and I, after I've mocked it up in Photoshop, I print it out and I laminate the photo and I do a one-to-one. -one. You'll notice that my face is one-to-one. -one. And a lot of these guys, Parkinson, Cadwell, Stowicki, all these guys painted one-to-one. -one. And you can see I'm going with the small round. What I usually do is I usually will, if I'm working, not for a demo, I just want to preface what I'm, what, uh, what I'm about to say here. Um, when I typically, when I work on a painting, I work from the front, I, I work from the back to the front and I work with the big brush first and I narrow my, myself down to a small brush. The one exception being in the beginning with the protagonist or subject of each piece, I usually nail down the face right away because for me, I struggle with faces and I need to be fresh when I'm doing them, especially if they're like bigger faces. So I tend to, while I have my uh, most of my calories, my mental calories still with me. I tend to get the face out of the way and it also helps me. Okay, so this is the, how the face is gonna look in that value structure that I'm establishing. It, the, from there, I usually will switch it up and go to the back of the image and I'll work from the back to the front and I'll use a large filbert, like a large, large rounded brush and uh, block in the sky, block in the middle ground, block in the foreground, block in the extreme foreground and the characters. And that's the order that I usually work in. I also, when I, when I start my painting, depending on what section of the painting I'm doing, I'll oil in, I'll do a little linseed, a thin, thin film of linseed oil over an area first, just to get a little bit of, help me facilitate coverage and give a little bit of uh, vibrance to the pigment. But for this particular uh, image, this face, what I did here was, I wanted to get it done quickly, so I didn't oil it at all. I just kind of globbed the paint on there, a little bit thicker than normal, but still very thin you know, still kind of like um, lean on lean, but I just kept piling the paint, the layers right on top of each other, wet and wet until I was happy with the face. I stepped away, I think for 24 hours and came back, adjusted it, and then went into the sky and the dragon. So that's sort of what I did with this particular piece. And that's usually how I start all these big paintings. Um, let me switch over to the chat here. So yeah, the mediums I typically work in, I work in oil, uh, watercolor gouache, I work in all of them, um, but I prefer oil. And we'll see, there's a little bit of low only action here. Let me just move that slider along. What I'm doing, if there, when you see pauses in the action like that, what I'm doing is I'm actually mixing my colors. I did record myself mixing my palette. Again, I use a Zorn limited palette and I do what's called like a gray line where I mix uh, a white to black with a grayscale, I have a grayscale slider that I use. And then I mix my colors that I'm gonna use in either the face or whatever section of the painting I'm doing that correspond in value to that white, that, to that gray line that I made. So I have like a grid by the end of the palette making process, I have like a grid of colors that I'm using. And then what I'll do is again, you'll notice all that splatter of oil paint before I took my color checker away. I had splattered oil paint on that color checker. That was me running the co colors over the face to see if the color in the reference matched the color on my brush. And then if I, you know, because it's laminated, you can use a bit of um, linseed oil and a Q-tip to wipe off your color checker. And I got the colors pretty good. The, the photo's definitely a little more exposed, but that's fine. And I think that eye, I don't know if I fixed that eye yet. Uh, Let's see, let's go a little bit. Yeah, I did. I think I fixed it at that point. Looks like looks like it's darker and I adjusted the highlights. So I'm using a Q-tip to kind of oil in right now. Just getting that sky, getting ready to paint in that sky with my arm in the way. And then next after I do the sky, I'm gonna I'm going to get into doing the dragon. Some of the other artists that I we didn't get to, I had a whole bunch of other artists I wanted us to look at, but we can discuss them while we we have this playing. Is um, we have Todd Lockwood, who is actually a big influence on. He's an artist I recently discovered in the last couple of years or so, and he sort of came in in the '90s, 
along with Brahm and revolutionized the way that dragons are painted. Uh, and um, uh, before that, the anatomy on dragons was kind of inconsistent at TSR, but Lockwood kind of came in, I'm getting the excess off so it doesn't drip right there. Um, and he based his dragons off of cat anatomy. He, 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 um, and you'll notice in my color checker, I actually, if, I don't know if I pan over to it, but one of the references that I stitched in there was a leopard for the body of the dragon. And yeah, this is, I, I have a whole setup down here. I work with um, movie studio lights. I have some movie lights that I put on either side of my canvas because you want to work in museum quality lighting if you can. So you want to get like, and the atelier has those lights as well. Um, I think I forget the name escapes me, but they're the black track lights that you can get. Mu yes, museum quality lighting would be not too yellow, not too white, just even 50-50 lighting. And I would say like whatever, when you walk into a museum that even, you want nice even lighting. You don't want a distinct light source from anywhere. I would say middle of the day with the light on, right? Picture your living room with, you know, the door closed, middle of the day light on overhead, a nice ambient light, right? So you can see how my surface is fairly bright. You can see that the guy's face is pretty visible. If I turn the light off on that right now, he would look more, a little bit more contrasty like he does in the photo, but um, that's because I have the light on either side of the canvas as well. Like you never wanna put your light when you're painting, you don't wanna put your lights facing your canvas. You want the lights either above your canvas, look at beaming down, or you want the light on either side. I have two lights on either side of my canvas. Uh, or in this case, my board, I should say, and they're both facing my board. And right now I'm just kind of going in with a big, big brush. And this is more typical of what I would normally do where I start from the front and then make work my way forward. But that's hopefully that answers your question as far as museum quality lighting. It's just a very even sort of midday, even ambient light, not too strong, not too, not too uh, gallery lighting is another way of, you know, where it's just more ambient, you can't really tell, okay, where's this light source coming from? A lot of people get weird about their paintings if they do a painting in museum quality lighting and then they take it home and look at it again. They don't like their painting because what happens is they're looking at it in dark, dark light and it looks messed up in the dark light because they didn't paint it in dark light, they painted it in museum quality light, right? But a lot of people get thrown by that mentally and then they go back into their painting and they, <laughs> They'll ruin it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's something that you want to be aware of as you're painting that you want to bear in mind your painting is not going to look good with the light off, right? Or with a dim light. It's going to look good in the light that you painted in. So you want to try to bear that in mind. And I'm trying to get that milky sky that I see just laying in some clouds, laying in some shapes. And you can see I, I definitely am not like a fast painter. I kind of take my time. Um, I actually did this, believe it or not, quicker than I usually would work in an oil painting. But yeah, just laying in some clouds. And the underdrawing also is really important. I know a lot of painters will paint Al Prima. I know that there's some structures at the Atelier that are very good at painting Al Prima. Um, but for me, I come out of more of an illustration background. Like I worked in comics professionally. Uh, for I worked for an agency called Glasshouse Graphics for uh, a year or so and then uh, was doing a lot of independent work before that. Um, and I come out of a drawing first background. So for me, I was just, it was just second nature to go off of a tight underdrawing. The thing is you just don't wanna be a slave to the underdrawing and you don't wanna know where to add the detail in your drawing and where to let the paint really pick up the slack because that can tighten up your painting and stiffen it up if you're not careful. That's the advantage of doing Al Prima, you know, to look more like a Frisetta, it'll be extremely loose. But yeah, you can see that I'm just kind of noodling away at this. And then it, I, I uh, crank the speed up quite a bit when we get to the actual dragon. But I would, quite, yes, question about underpainting with this art style. Go for it, what's your question? I definitely would recommend it if, if that's your question. I would say, um, Definitely want to do if you're going to go real, do realism or sort of a more realistic type of look, 
you really want to have like a solid underdrawing. And again, I, you don't have to render every single thing. Is pencil art okay? Yeah, I use pencil. This is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm using pencil. So I, I, if you want to use vine charcoal, I mean, everybody has their own method. Again, I come out of that comic book background where I'm used to using a mechanical pencil. So let me explain my process. I'll get into more of the technical as, we're, as, as you're watching me lay in the sky. So what I do is first I get the I get MDF four board from Home Depot. And actually, uh, when I started getting back into painting at the atelier, I was teaching the in-person comics class there. And I just had an urge to start painting again. And I really spent my first year teaching at the atelier. I was already drawing 10, 15 years, but I was a little rusty in my painting because I hadn't painted in some time since Pratt. So what I did is I spent that first year of my teaching at the school to, I took advantage of the studio there and really just leveled up my painting and try, gathered up all the knowledge I could. And so um, what I ended up doing was um, one of the other instructors at the school told me when I was you know, looking at canvases and surface to go with MDF board because I, I'd explained that I don't really like can, cotton canvas. It has too much of a tooth. Linen is too, I don't know, it's, it doesn't have enough sturdiness to it. I like to hit the board a little bit and beat the board up. So, you know, MDF was a logical choice. And I, what I do is I get the MDF board from Home Depot. I sand it down. I make a peach colored acrylic gesso and I'll apply the gesso, sand it once, apply it again, sand it again. And when I sand it the final time, I leave a little tiny bit of a tooth similar to what you get on linen so that the paint grips and it doesn't wipe off. You don't wipe off layers underneath. And so what I do with my gesso is I will um, take acrylic paint and mix it in with the gesso. I use yellow ochre, red, and white and get it to like that sort of orangey peach consistency. I find it's good for flesh. And it also, you can pop, you, the colors pop off it. So you can kind of, it's good to create haze effects with. It's also, it's got enough heat to it, but not so much. It's, you know, you can do earth tones over it. You can do like more brights over it. It's just a good uh, gesso to use. And so I, you know, I swear I, I'm pretty much at this point, I've got a formula down where I just use the MDF board. And so after I've gotten my board to the point where I like the tooth on it, I'll then go into the computer in Photoshop. I spend at least like a day or two just meticulously searching reference. And um, then I mock my color checker together. I put my color, I do a one-to-one -one printout. And then I do my underdrawing based on my mock-up. In a, I use a HB 0.5 Pentel mechanical pencil to do my underdrawing with. And I find that works well. I don't use a softer leg because it can smudge. I don't use a harder leg because if I need to make adjustments on the fly, it's harder to erase. And I don't want to go in and like, you know, pick up any of the gesso by beating up on it. So you can see I'm getting that milky sky now. And I'm trying to keep my edges soft. I'm going to have to go in actually after this, after the fact, probably when I'm able to sit down and do more of this and reactivate some of those edges, which you can do in oil. You always, that's the other thing people in oil don't really think about when you're painting in oils. You want to make your edges as soft as possible when you're doing organics, of particularly human faces. Um, and you know, to mimic that, that camera lens, that effect that you get of the camera, when you look through a camera, you're getting a, little, a lot of soft edges in that camera shot, right? So you know, you'll see I did some of the ruins behind the head in the character, and I kind of didn't just do the face, but I went out a little bit from the face. That's because I wanted to get wet on wet with those edges while the paint was still fairly um, loose and not hardened. Um, but how do I color? Yeah, that's how I color my gesso. I'll use an acrylic. I, 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 it's like, you know, acrylic gesso combo. There's other artists that don't like acrylic based gessos. There's other, there's a guy I follow on YouTube who's absolutely phenomenal. And he is just a, a master portrait artist. I don't use that term light, uh, lightly, but he's pretty incredible. And he doesn't like the just the acrylic gesso. I prefer the acrylic gesso for what I'm doing because I'm not, you know, he's doing a slightly different thing than me. He's focused exclusively on portraits. I'm focused on imaginative realism. So, I mean, that's sort of, you know, almost apples to oranges in some ways. Not, not really, because we're both doing realism in some ways, but he's got pretty tight photo reference right in front of him, whereas I'm stitching together stuff. And I get it. Everybody has their own method. But uh, this is just a, 
we'll see if it speeds up a little bit here. We're almost getting to that halfway point. There was a little bit of a time jump. So you can see, I, it looks like I definitely fixed the face. And then um, I fixed that eye. The eye was a little, the eye was a little janky before. So I went in and fixed it. And I moved the position of the camera a little closer so we can get a clearer visual of what I'm doing. I am left-handed, so I do apologize if my left hand gets in the way. I'm going in again. I'm going in with a small brush here because for the purposes of the demonstration, I wanted to do one section of this painting and get it to a complete finish so that you could see how it looks when it's kind of started and how it looks when it's finished. Normally, what I would do is, again, I would block in more of this with a big brush before going to like a tiny brush like this. But the advantage to doing it this way, you know, is because I did this for a demo, now I have the dragon's head sorted, I can always go in after it's hardened and do a glaze on it. If I want to add more detail, take detail away. And I, I still have plenty of room to play with the background too. So, I mean, basically, you know, if I would say if faces are something you struggle with, and again, for me, particularly, I think human faces just are so difficult. I think one thing you need to do is for me, I need to be mentally fresh and my head needs to be clear when I start a new painting like this. And I do the face first, get it out of the way, get it sorted. So, and I do it while I'm fresh, so I'm not rushing through it. And then that le lets me, uh, that leaves room for the, the dessert of the piece, which is the imaginative component, which is this dragon, which was a blast of paint. And with the dragon, I'm going in a little bit like thicker. I'm not going in like, I'm not going lean on lean as much. Still going in painting pretty thin though, uh, even with like imaginative stuff where I don't have to like be as quite as meticulous, I can make more of it up. I still paint pretty thin. I'm not like one of these guys that does like impasto, but we had some fantastic painters at the atelier that do like impasto stuff and they work large format and all that stuff. This is like the biggest I usually work is 18 by 24. And, uh, when I do book covers, because I do some book covers as well, I'll work at this size. It usually takes me a couple of weeks to knock out a cover because I'm, I'm doing it around my in-person teaching and my other teaching and I have other smaller commissions I'm doing and I'm doing shows. So like, you know, if I could just sit and work on it, I could probably knock it out in like four days or something. Um, but because I'm stepping away and coming back, generally it'll take me about two weeks if I'm on a job to do a piece. And if I'm just doing a piece as part of a series, it usually just is like, a, you know, several weeks. Over the course of several weeks, I'll knock out a, a lot of oil painting. It just depends on what I'm doing it for, what the purpose is. Um, but this dragon was tons of fun to do. And you can see like the luminosity you're getting. It's almost, it looks like Naples yellow, but that's actually um, just yellow ochre with a butt made into a cream. I'm going in now and I'm doing a wing and the wing, I wanna add purples and yellows and reds to it and create like the sort of feel of a membrane and go a little like crazier with the colors. The dragon is generally gonna be green, but I want it to go a little more rainbow and I wanted to make it, the wings look more beautiful. Like this, I, I'm, I also am gonna give the dragon more feathers and do like a raptor, give him more raptor features. Um, because uh, the last few dragons I've done, I did like one that was sort of like a polar dragon in the previous painting I did. Uh, the idea being that this this dragon would be a, uh, living in like the polar regions of the planet somewhere. So it, it was blue and I gave him fur. And then the piece I did before that, I did like an Asian Middle uh, Eastern inspired dragon. So it looked like a serpent. This, this, this particular dragon is gonna be more sort of bird-like or more conventional, like a conventional dragon, but with more tropical, vibrant colors on the wings. And you can see, I didn't, I really like to take my time. I'm not, you know, when I'm doing these, I kind of get in the zone and I'll, ah, that's a good question. Yes, yeah, so excellent question. Um, Yes, I do look at reference. I don't do the James Gurney thing where James Gurney is a famous paleo artist and he will make models and maquettes. A few of my students do that. A few of my students make models of, I think, uh, of their work um, and I, I'm all for it. Um, with this particular piece, because I was under the gun a little bit because um, I was getting it ready for, for us today. So I wanted to knock out this face quickly and knock out this dragon quickly. I didn't use a model for this, but I do look at reference. I reference meticulously. 
I also look at a lot of art though. I don't just look at photos. I'll look at like to see how an artist like Todd Lockwood again really has like been influential in how I approach drag draconic art. Like he he looks at a lot of animals that you wouldn't necessarily think to look at for dragons, like cats, um, and animals that have defined musculature. And then he's also very good at sort of indicating scales. But what he'll do is lay in the tone first. So what I do is I lay in my tone first, and then I go in and I'll do the scales. And you'll see later on when I go back to the dragons, the actual face of the dragon, I'll end up at a certain point laying in scales over that dragon. Right now, I'm just doing the values and the under the tones, and then I go back in and give it texture later on. But yes, I definitely, uh, models is something I've played around with doing more of, but I definitely use a lot of rep meticulous reference for like reptiles and but not just reptiles, iguanas. If I'm looking at reptiles, I'll look at iguanas because they have some cool scales. They have those crazy scales under their jowls, those big oval scales that are cool. Um, I look at cats as well. Just I think Lockwood is onto some cool cool ideas with when it comes to that. So I'll look at um I'll look at a lot of cats for dragon reference. I'll look at dinosaurs. I've looked at a uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex for my polar dragon. I was referencing a T Rex. Sometimes I'll go look at movies and I'll pause movies if I see a shot from a movie I like. If it's like a Stan Winston, you know, joint where um, the T-Rex looks amazing because an ILM designed it. Um, I'll look at a scene that has the T-Rex roaring and I'll pause it and use that as reference. And I try not to do things that are, when I'm looking at photo reference, I try not to get stuff that's overexposed or like washed out. That's something I did in the past where I would just, my stuff looked washed out because I was getting reference that was like washed out, right? So you don't want to get artwork, uh, reference that's overexposed. Um, I imagine for like doing models though, you could probably use Sculpey for that. Um, just you need to have an oven, right? You need to be comfortable with Sculpey. I've dabbled in sculpture, but mostly pumpkin sculpture. <laughs> I, I do pumpkin sculpting. Um, in the before times, before 2020, I was doing it every October. And then forget about it. After 2020, I did it last year, but I was up in Vermont for about a month. And then I was splitting my time between Westchester, where the studio is, and Burlington, Vermont, which is where I am now. And that was insane because I had to rent a U-Haul. And rentals, that was just when rentals were spiking. So I don't know if I'm and I'm, I'm getting married this October, so I don't think I'm going to be uh, doing it this year. But the, the, you know, pumpkin sculpting is, I don't know if you guys have ever been to a pumpkin sculpting event. They're pretty cool. But yeah, that's a great question. Do I look at reptile reference? Yeah, but I tried to also look at other animals too. You know, monkeys, bats, um, cats, cats are good dogs even, giraffes. Depends on the type of creature you're designing. I mean, this, again, this, this particular dragon was a lot of fun to work on. Um, and let me see here. Let me just go to the slider and see. Oh, wait, we have time. Let's see. Let's check the time. 57. We got plenty of time. But yeah, if anybody else has any other questions, I mean, you know, feel free to ask away. I know that we have... Um, Let's see what other artists we have. Matt Stawicki was another artist that was a big influence on me. And Matt Stawicki is one of these guys that paints primarily in oil now. He also has a YouTube channel called Stawicki Shop, which has not enough subscribers, in my opinion. So it's criminal how many people don't know about his channel. Um, he's got like, I don't know, under a thousand subs, but he's an incredible artist. And I, I imagine he's an older guy, so maybe... When I say older, I mean, I don't mean old. I mean, compared to, you know, I'm 40, so he's probably in his mid 50s. Um, maybe he's just not as savvy with YouTube, so he doesn't really take it too seriously. I think he just kind of goes on there and he doesn't advertise it or, you know, it's for him that YouTube is more of an afterthought. So um, he's just going on there and taping himself. But the artwork is incredible. And Stawicki Shop is the name of the channel. And I think he sells his stuff on there. Definitely someone you should check out. And he actually switched to digital early on. Well, he worked for Dragon Lance, which was a again an offshoot of D and D. And he did the books that came out in the. Uh, there's my shoulder. 
Yeah, yeah, I can definitely explain that. So basically, it was as soon as my big shoulder gets out of the way, um, what I did for cats, and uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll share my desktop at a certain point, and I'll show you the color picker that I designed, so you can see. But basically, off panel right now is that big color picker that you might have noticed I taped up from earlier on my board. It's still taped up to my board. It's just not we're not seeing it because the aspect ratio of the phone, right? But what I did is I picked a, I, I did a, I took a picture of a leopard crouching and or no lioness, excuse me. I took a picture of a female lioness crouching and I stitched it into my uh, Photoshop collage. And I took a illustration of a dragon that I really liked. It was black and white, which actually helped me out with this one. So I was seeing just the values and I Photoshopped the illustration of the dragon from the head down to the neck on top of the crouched lioness. So the body is, is a lion's body. And then the, basically like when you get to the musculature. So I look at the musculature and like basically the wings on my dragon tend to, the muscles that connect the wings to the body will snake over the shoulders, of, the shoulder blades of the front legs. So they kind of work into those front shoulder blades. You, you can kind of barely see it off to the right, some of the, where the muscles are bunched up, there's a wing, it's a little hard to tell, but by that chain, it starts to, the wing muscle starts to form and go up into the wing that's near us. Yes, yes. By one of the artist cats, yes. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great, you know what? It's funny you mentioned those movies. We watched my fiance and I watched How to Train Your Dragon the other day. And they're such delightful movies. I um I forgot how fun they are. And and the design is great in those movies. I love the way they did the dragon riders, like hiccup with his mechanical leg. But yeah, the cats are great because they're lithe, they're sort of predatory, but they're also elegant and like, you know kind of regal, right? <laughs> you know, cats have that regal bearing when you go to pet them, they look at you cross-eyed and they, they look at you sideways like you're a peasant or something. <laughs> at least my cats look at me like I'm a peasant. Um, you know, I go to pet my cat and she looks at me and goes, what do you want, peasant? Um, but yeah, you know, cats are great. I, I miss, I, I, the place I'm at up in Vermont um, is beautiful but we we can't have pets here so we have an entire first floor of a house and a basement and, and a porch but no pets so I had to leave my cats with my folks when I moved up here so I was kind of um kind of bummed about that but we had five cats before when I was in New York we had five of them and uh, cats are really they move in a very interesting way too um uh and you can see it uh, slowly like layering in the texture and scales now. And I'm painting, I'm trying to preserve what we're doing, what we call preserving the abstraction. Like I'm not, it looks like I'm rendering this thing to death, but I'm really not. Like if you zoom in, it gets very brush strokey really quick, kind of like a sergeant painting. Like if you ever look at a John Singer sergeant, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm anywhere near as good as sergeant. I'm not, <laughs> I'm very much a student myself. Um, but um, what sergeant did was he would, keep it very abstract when you looked at his paintings up close. And when you look at them from far away, they tighten up. And that's kind of what I'm doing here with the dragon, trying to anyway. Again, not nearly as good as um, Sergeant. <laughs> Sergeant was a genius. I mean, I think um, he also worked extremely large and extremely, he, you know, Sar John Singer Sargent's a, an artist that everybody should go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and check out his work. It's incredible it's super it's large format like I think the pieces are 20 feet tall and he did these things really quick and they look super tight from far away and then when you go up to the piece it just looks like a bunch of random brush strokes and there's my um so I'm just zoom. I don't know what I'm doing there I'm kind of um giving us a headache and there we go now that we've all got vertigo let's continue with the uh, demonstration I think I'm just repositioning my camera so that we get a little bit more um, of a visual here. Let me just skip ahead a tiny bit. I was mixing. That's what was going on. I was mixing colors on my palette. 
I also, as far as palettes go, I use paper palettes. I use palette pads, but I use the gray, the ones that are tinted. I don't do the white palette paper. I use like the gray tinted palette paper because you can judge the color easier off of it. Um, if I'm run out of fancy schmancy palette paper, then I'll use the white palettes that I have. But, you know, um, these are mixed media brushes too, these small detail brushes. But if I'm working bigger, I like Zen is a good brand of brush to use. If, you know, it doesn't really, the brand is sort of incidental. You just want good quality brushes. It could be Windsor Newton, it could be Zen, it could be whatever. You just want, I, I, I tend to use the synthetic bristles. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not oiling down this dragon. I'm kind of globbing the paint on quickly. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, generally I'll take my time a little more, but for this, I wanted to, I wanted to try to get this, this entire dragon's face squared away. I could have spent the demo blocking in the dragon, but I wanted to give you guys an example of what it, a section of at least a section of this thing would look like finished. Um, Cause it's nice to see like the start and then the finish of something, right? So I figured doing a bust of a dragon would be a good way to go. Um, and these are, again, this is a fairly large painting. So this, this is like a five by seven section here, but how do you clean your brushes? Actually, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. These are great questions. So, cause there's so much to cover. I can't think of what, to, where to start. So it's good that you guys are asking this stuff. Um, so yeah, so I actually don't clean my brushes, especially if I'm doing human faces, I don't clean my brushes because I want, again, I want to paint dirty and I want to get as much of that gray and grit in my human faces and, and even my organic animals too, like my dragons as possible. The only time I clean my brushes is if there's a really stark value change, and I mean like stark value change, then I'll clean my brushes. I, I go thin and then I'm wiping my brush down periodically with paper towel, uh, very frequently in between strokes with paper towels to keep the, the coat thin and whatever grit or grime I have on my brush that after I wipe it down, I, I'll mix that into my next neutral color because I'm usually going cool and warm neutrals. But then if I'm going to an extreme value shift, right, then I, I might clean my brush and I'll use like a Da Vinci brush cleaner. Um, what are non-toxic synth thinners to use? Um, terpenoid is non-toxic. I, well, I don't know if it's non-toxic, but it's not, it's, it's, it's better for the environment and it's less toxic, right? It's odorless. I don't think it's toxic per se. You, obviously you don't want to go near, you don't want to hold your nose up to it and breathe it in, but if you have it and you seal it and you're using it consistently, but sealing it and, and you're in a well-ventilated area, I think you're okay with terpenoid. What about medium? Yeah. So Medium, I use, um, there was a time where I used liquid, um, but I've quickly did got away from that. I don't like liquid. Um, I'm much more of a wet on wet guy now than I was when I was do, going through that phase. I would say medium, I use um, linseed oil is the one thing I really use. I'll also use some, sometimes I'll use stand oil. And then you can, um, other times, uh, I'm trying to think what else. I use a painting medium by Windsor & Newton. It's actually called paint medium. And so basically paint medium and lin linseed oil do similar things. They improve, improve luminosity. They uh, help you as manage transitions between edges so you can soften edges easier. Um, and they also um, uh, prevent the paint from cracking as well. And they improve flow. And that is, the, that is linseed oil, refined linseed oil. And that's also um, Windsor Newton um, paint medium. It's called paint medium. Um, so that's what I would, and, and if, you, if you don't have the money for a brush cleaner, I think if you get, um, do you varnish when done? Yes, I do. I do varnish when done. Um, and now I wait six months before I varnish it. Because if you don't, uh, I, what I did in the past was I didn't wait six months and you, get, you can get smokiness to the painting because what happens is as the paint is hardening, it doesn't dry oil paint, but it hardens. And as the paint hardens, what happens is, um, you know, it releases fume. It not not fumes, but you know, it releases the paint in gaseous form, I guess, over time. And what happens is, if you varnish it too early, the paint evaporates and is trapped inside the coating of the varnish, so you get like a smokiness to your painting. But if you wait six months, 
the paint will be hard enough where you can safely varnish it. And so for varnish off the top of my head, I don't, I have a varnish downstairs that I use. I want to say it's, um, I'd have to look honestly, but I could definitely uh, find that information out. I, I haven't varnished in a while. So at the moment, the brand escapes me, but it's, I think it's a Windsor and Newton brand. I, I, I use pretty much swear by Windsor Newton. I know some people don't like Windsor Newton. It's funny. We have a Holbein wholesaler up here. Um, and like, he also was like, you know, the, the art supply store, he's the local sort of Dick Blick up here. And I went in there and I asked the guy after I moved up here, I was like, Hey, you guys got like Windsor Newton paints. And he like got all crazy and <laughs> yelled at me and told me Windsor Newton's horrible. <laughs> uh, Gambars. Yeah. Gambling. People use gambling. The guy that I follow on YouTube, that portrait artist that I talked to you about, he uses, I think a gambling based um, solvent when he's doing his underpainting. Um, he paints differently. So there's another way you can paint too. If you're, if you're more into portraits, what this guy does, he draws the paint, he draws, he uses graphite. He works on linen. He'll draw his, he'll draw his underdrawing on linen in graphite. And then what he'll do is he will then paint, a, make a sepia. He'll use that gambling solvent and mix in like a sepia, a sepia scale palette. And he will trace every line on his underdrawing, trace over it in a sepia and block in the whole thing in sepia. Then he lets it dry 24 hours. Then he goes back in with, a, with, a, with an underpainting where he's painting thin um, and he's using more of that gambling solvent, I think, but not saturating it, a tiny bit of it, not too much, so that you know you can you you can get coverage. And then what he's doing is he's uh, going in and doing the averages, like those warm and cool neutral averages first. Then he lets that dry 24 hours, and then on day three he comes back in and does the modeling and the details. And the work does speak for itself. I have to say he's phenomenal. Um, but for me, I just prefer wet on wet. I prefer this sort of a little bit more of a fast and loose way of working and a little bit more of an abstract, you know, sort of trying to just main embrace that abstraction, like, uh, you know, the Boris Vallejo sort of thin on thin method is sort of what I prefer. I also work on panel, not linseed oil, uh, not, li not uh, linen. What am I saying? Not linen. Um, I know like a lot of them painters swear by linen. Um, I've been told to do linen in the past. <laughs> There's people at the atelier that I, you know, that other instructors that have tried to get me into linen <laughs> someday, maybe. I just am used to, but then again, I'm, I'm used to this now. And uh, I think that's important too, is when you're painting, whatever you're comfortable doing, you want to just like go with that, whatever is easy, right? Don't overcomplicate it. If you have a formula, it works. Like, you know, you get into a formula, then don't reinvent the wheel. A lot of painters, what they'll do is they'll try this method once and they'll try that method once and they never settle on perfecting a formula. And in the beginning, you want to try different methods for sure. But if you get to a certain confidence level with a certain way of doing it, then you just want to like work it that way and get really good at doing it that way so that it becomes plug and play. Like at this point, doing it this dragon right now, I'm, I could tell you when I was doing this, I was not thinking too hard. I was just kind of plug and play. Again, with certain things like faces, I'm always going to be, uh, my head will always have to be clear, but with these sorts of creatures, it's, I'm just on autopilot right now at this point mentally in the painting process. I'm not overthinking it, taking my time. Again, I'm a slow painter. Um, generally, I like to take my time. So uh, oil kind of is like a paint. I feel like it's like a painter's paint, right? If you like to take your time and noodle away at stuff, oil is the paint for you. If you're trying to do a magazine cover really quick, you might want to do gouache or acrylic. Like I've done gouache for rush pieces and stuff. Um, you know, if I'm trying to get a bunch of pieces ready for a show, I'd switch to gouache and I'll just knock out tons of gouache pieces. Um, I don't know if we have any fans of gouache in the chat, but I would recommend gouache. Gouache is pretty versatile. You can use it with watercolor. People say it's difficult. I don't find it that difficult. But then again, I don't find watercolor that difficult either. And watercolor tends to give people trouble. I found oil more difficult initially, believe it or not, um, before I, I kind of like learned to let the medium do the work for me. Do you do thumbnails? Yes, I do. I do do thumbnails. 
Um, in fact, for the Mulan style dragon that I did, I did a piece that was sort of a, a Shang-Chi Mulan homage uh, around the end of last summer. I did extensive thumbnails for that piece, you know, designing the character, designing the serpent. Um, but then other times I'll just switch right to the Photoshop mock-up. At this point, I'm kind of confident enough in my method where I just kind of mock things up in Photoshop. Obviously, the best thing to do is paint from life. Um, you know, life, there's no substitute for the real thing. But when you're doing imaginative subject matter, you have to get creative, especially if you're on a budget. Um, you know, and you can't afford to necessarily go out and hire a model. It's good to know the Adobe Suite because getting the Adobe Suite as a student or a teacher with that discount, while still expensive, is far, far cheaper than going out and hiring a model and then, you know, light metering, professionally shooting that model. Like, again, some, a lot of artists, a lot of veteran painters are really well, well versed in like photography as well and shooting the subject. I'm not, I'm, I'm good at photo editing because I actually worked as a graphic designer. So I know the Adobe suite, I teach Photoshop as well, but um, I'm not that great at photography. I'm not a professional photographer. I have people in my network that will shoot my photos. Actually, one of the other instructors, Bill Graff, um, was kind enough to shoot a bunch of my pieces last time I was down there. So like, shout out to Bill. Thanks for helping me shoot those pieces. <laughs> Save me a lot of money, my friend. But um, yeah, no, and Bill's a fantastic instructor. I would say like, I learned a lot just from having discussions with Bill when I was getting back into painting. And, uh, you know, he was, he turned me on to a lot of these techniques that I'm using. Because you got to remember, when I was getting back into painting, again, I was a 15 years of drawing under my belt and working in the industry, but I had not painted since Pratt. So we're talking like a five-year break and like um, eight-year break, maybe. Yeah, eight-year break. And so my drawing at the time when I was at Pratt was not nearly as good as it was when I was teaching at the atelier. So like, I kind of like, cratered and burned with my oil painting when I was a Pratt. But then when I went back to it at the atelier, because my drawing was so much better at that point, the painting was way better than it had ever been. And that just kind of ignited this sort of addiction to oil painting that, that happened. And uh, from there, I just got my skills up, took, spent about two or three years just continually painting because I already had the drawing at that point and just got familiar with the medium, different mediums and learned how to apply my drawing, you know, you know, how to synergize my drawing and my values, my, my way that I indicate values. And so that was kind of cool. That's the benefit of drawing though. Do, oh, Alex Ross, it works in gouache, pretty amazing. Yeah, he's, he's crazy. Um, Alex Ross, uh, He's good. There's a French artist too that draws in a similar style to Alex Roth. You'll, uh, and you'll see here, I'm holding my arm away. I don't use those like those like rods that they have you guys use or something. Like they have those like um, poles with the balls on the end that you can use to stabilize your arm. I just kind of hold my arm. But um, Alex Roth is an incredible draftsman. He's incredible uh, at, at judging values. And um, But there's a French artist who no one knows about who I've never heard of, who I discovered when I was at Pratt, who's like twice as good as Alex Ross is. <laughs> and like, he's insanely fast. He did like a 200 page comic in that sort of high realism style. But it was just the timeline had to have been crazy because there was just two to 300 pages of this. It was in this hardback. It was a French painter. I forget the name of the guy, but he, um, if you look up French sci-fi art, Alex Ross, um, or French sci-fi art, Alex Ross style, it might come up. Um, it was a cyberpunk book, but there's tons of talented people. If you go in art station, there's some insane artists on art station. I can't, I can't go on there <laughs> too often. I get, even me at, at this stage, I get, it's easy to get intimidated, but you know, you, you just got to use it to get encouraged. You can't get put off by like, art. there's always going to be an artist that's uh, further along or older than you in drawing years, I find. Um, but yeah, Alex Ross is great. Frazetta, obviously, the Death Dealer is great. Um, oddly enough, Frazetta, Frazetta's granddaughter has an Instagram called Frazetta Girls, and she kind of handles all Frank Frazetta's art art sales, the Frazetta estate. 
And uh, I've had some really positive interactions with them on Instagram. You know, they're really pleasant, nice people. Um, uh, you know, I follow them, but they're busy. You know, I, they, they don't follow me, but <laughs> it's because they get bombarded uh, by collectors, I'm sure. But they're, uh, they're really good to follow. I'd recommend following them because they do like prints. You can see Frank Rosetta's work on skateboards. You can see it on mugs. because It's cool to see his work on licensed products um, to see how it translates. And his style was, again, sort of retro, like the stuff, the Keith Parkinson, the guys that came after Frazetta were way tighter. And I appreciate Keith Parkinson's like draftsmanship, but there's just something about like how loose and dynamic Frazetta is, like the energy in his figures is just incredible. And then you can see sort of the Frazetta influence in Brahms work too. Um, Mastawicki, again, a little bit more influenced by Keith Parkinson, I think. He cites Frazetta, but I think everybody kind of cites Frazetta. I mean, I've cited Frazetta on my own website, but I honestly think I'm probably more influenced by James Gurney than anybody else. Um, James Gurney, Todd Lockwood, um, Boris Vallejo is a big influence of mine. Those are the three big ones. Frazetta, I would say to a degree, but Frazetta is definitely just way better at being loose than I am. Um, so good at the at being dynamic it's just something that i still am kind of working towards i think but um you know i'm trying to think who other amazing some other amazing comic book artists but those are great questions you guys are asking yeah you know, solvents and whatnot there are other you know speaking of like paint mediums and solvents there's like other um there are other uh teachers you know that i've talked to and that they they're all about liquid and they're all about using liquid to speed up drying time and they're all about um these this or that paint medium but i just i try to keep it fairly simple my color palette that i use again i think i mentioned it's a zorn limited palette there's also um the riley palette and the atelier flower field does teach the riley method i find that the riley palette for me personally and I, I think it is beneficial to know and be aware of, but it's a lot of sort of like planning and like, it's a little hard to get around in the beginning. And for me, I just prefer the Zorn Limited palette because it's, it's, it's no fuss. You just four, four colors plus blue and you're good to go. And then if you can do a gray line, you're good. You know, if you can, you know, use it to judge your values and you don't need to really go any more complicated than that. And then as far as my drawings go, my human figures, I looked a lot at Andrew Loomis. I looked a lot at uh, George Bridgman um, just when I was trying to improve my comic work because I would had editors. I had the guy at Dark Horse Comics. He told me that my figures were really bad. And this was when I was trying to get work out of Pratt. And he was like, you need to like get better. Your figures are really bad. So like, I was like, all right, I need to go back to the drawing board. And then I just started looking at Andrew Loomis and I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to forget trying to draw like a style. I'm just going to draw everybody that I'm going to make everybody look like an Andrew Loomis figure. And then I'm going to show these editors. And if they still st st say that I'm horrible at that point, then I know there's something fishy going on because, you know, I'm just going to be. And, and luckily, it, I definitely got into an agency after after I retooled my style, I got into a talent agency. But I mean, worked for a few companies. But I mean, um, you know, Andrew Loomis is a great a great artist to, to learn from. Right now, I'm just blocking in the teeth. Finally, we're getting near the end of the line with this thing, um, and uh, I'm doing like cream. But then I also am going to mix in some grays. Like right now, that's a super bright tooth. <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing the eye uh, on this guy. Like the eyes, little details, you know, you, need, you know, just getting those scales, get the light coming off those scales, trying to define your light source. Uh, I, I, I love, you know, it's funny. I guess I could, I could probably talk about painting for hours and hours. <laughs> This week was interesting because again, I had art camps all week. I teach in person up here with the Burlington City Arts. Uh, there are another 501C up here. And so they had art camps all week. So I was, I was doing this in the early hours in the morning. But yeah, I'm trying to think 
who else is a, a big influence besides Matt I mean, again, we mentioned James Gurney. James Gurney is an artist you want to look at. There's some great books that he did. Um, James Gurney did a book. Uh, it's called Color and Light. It's, it's basically a very, it's more academic. It's like basically how did, how does Gurney paint? Like what, what makes his painting method work? And it's instruction. It's an instructive book. It's like instructional. So if you want to learn how to paint like James Gurney, you can pick up Color and White. He goes over what he considers to be the principles and fundamentals of painting in that book. And then if you want to learn more about Gurney's career and basically get a book that's an awesome portfolio of his greatest hits, then you want to pick up Imaginative Realism by James Gurney. I have both books. Again, Imaginative Realism is the more fun book to look at because it's less academic. It's more just these are James Gurney's greatest hits. And it's just a book of his art. And it's like a concept art, like an art of Star Wars. Yes, I also I also have I also work digital. Um, again, I, I did mention I teach Photoshop. When I paint digitally, I paint in Photoshop. I know a lot of artists, um, which I'm gonna call it, a lot of artists use Procreate now. And you can do some fantastic things in Procreate. And again, a few of my adult students who are a little younger, they're in their 20s, they all use Procreate. I still swear by Photoshop. But Photoshop's expensive and Adobe's annoying, but if you can afford the uh, creative suite, which not everybody can, it's a lug and it's a, definitely a, a luxury purchase. And especially in, times are tough right now, but if you can afford it and you're fortunate enough to be able to afford it, I would highly recommend going with the Adobe Creative Suite. Procreate's also a fantastic program. But the versatility you get with Adobe Photoshop is just unparalleled. And you can, again, if you look at Matt Stawicki's artwork, um, if you do Matt Stawicki, Google Matt Stawicki Dragonlance, um, you'll see that um, his book covers look like they were done in oil paint, but he did them in Photoshop. And he did these back in 2000 with a primitive version of the program. So the power of Photoshop is real. And I, you know, I would recommend, I think a lot of video game companies and uh, I know Gabby's son works as a video game artist, so he could speak to this better than me. But from what I understand, it's similar in um, tabletop game design. It's similar in comics. A lot of video game companies, entertainment art companies are going digital because of the timelines and the deadlines. And it costs less, so it's just a practical thing. But if you're really good at traditional art, they'll still hire you. Like I think Wizards of the Coast recently hired a guy that I'm friends with Facebook on. His name is Stephen Russell Black. He's a he's a really good artist. He paints in oil, and they hired him last year to do a piece. So I mean, you can still get work. Yeah, you, yes, you can still get work uh, at Wizards of the Coast. Um, you know, painting in oil if you're really really good and you got a style that they that they like spark to. Um, you know, if, if the the, the what well, all that matters is the yeah, it's really awesome. All that matters is the image, really, right? So if you can paint good in oil then um, that is, uh, that is that, that's all, if you can paint good in oil or paint good in digital, it doesn't matter as long as the image looks good. Um, but a lot of people like Photoshop because it, again, you don't have to sit there and mix the colors. You don't have to sit there and prep. If you're tired, you can sit in your desk chair, turn on your computer and you could just go, right? And it's very convenient. I did a few Isaac Asimov fan arts in Photoshop as like proof of concept book covers. And that, that was fun. I did that last year and, and you know, I've done some digital portrait stuff. I prefer oil, but I don't mind working digital either. And I think it's a valid, it's totally valid. Ah, uh, yes, Photoshop over Illustrator. So my, illustr <laughs> my relationship with Adobe Illustrator is interesting. I, I worked, before I got into illustration, when I got out of Pratt 2011, 2012, I worked as a graphic designer for Victoria's Secret. So I worked in the pink division. I was working on the yoga pants graphics and whatnot. And I have to say that Adobe Illustrator is a very good tool for um, t-shirt design and for print production. If you're going to work on t-shirts, you need to know Illustrator just because it, it, it's instrumental in formatting files to be printed correctly, screen printed. Illustrator, however, I would not necessarily recommend as a picture making tool. I would recommend it as a graphic design tool. But if you're going, it's ironic because it's called Illustrator, but they should really call it Adobe Graphic Designer. And they should call Photoshop Adobe Illustrator because 
really to me, Illustrator is not an art making program so much as it is a graphic design program. And it's really good for production oriented artists, print production oriented artists who wanna do great t-shirt designs that have no printing hiccups in them. I also worked um, for a printer in Greenlawn, street artist, he, he, uh, he worked on a lot of hip hop material and he would do t-shirts for hip hop artists. And we used in that uh, role as well, I used a lot of Adobe Illustrator. And I was editing graphics and fitted hats and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was funny because uh, everybody else at the office was into like rap music and I was the only guy there who didn't really listen to rap and <laughs> went to comic conventions. <laughs> that was interesting. I also met a lot of, uh, believe it or not, I met a lot of rappers actually working in that job. I met, um, I met uh, one of the guys who was in a 50 cents band, whatever that was, he came in, he came into the studio. And then I met uh, one of the members of Wu-Tang Clan came in. Wu-Tang Clan's a really old rap group from the nineties. <laughs> some of you guys might know about it, some of you might not, but that, that dates me. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're um, that gives you an idea how old I am. They were big when I was in high school. <laughs> now, I don't know who's big now. Um, but yeah, he came into the studio and they're big comic book guys. So um, we sh I showed him some Batman drawings I was doing. And that was right as I was getting work with the talent agency. So I got work with my the talent agency and then I left that job after I got, because he was paying me, he was a nice guy, but he was not paying me that much to, to commute into Greenlawn. It was just a rough commute for not that much money so but it was a good experience i would say photoshop is the way to go though like if you're trying to do this type of stuff like you know imaginative fantasy art or procreate right if money's an issue you can use procreate and my student jonathan is really talented um and uses procreate he does some fantastic stuff in procreate um i'm trying to think I think uh, some of my other students um, as well, um, who've worked, who've I've taught in the past, uh, they all use Procreate because Adobe is a ripoff. <laughs> the only reason I'm able to afford Adobe is because I it's it's a, I re it's recyclable. It's a recyclable thing for me at this point, right? I teach a lot, and then I get paid from teaching, and then I can write that off, right, and then I take the write off, and I apply that towards, you know, I can apply that plus other things that, you know, I, I, I can write off towards my Adobe membership or, or what have you, so for me, it's like the economics work out for me to have Adobe and get the subscription. You said you think the program, will, would it be the one you, yes, yeah, so illustrate, yes, exactly, yes, so, so illustrator, Adobe illustrator, I was saying like they shouldn't call Adobe Illustrator Adobe Illustrator. So they should call Adobe Illustrator Adobe Graphic Designer. Like it's a graphic design program because it's vector based and it's used for large format. Whereas like Photoshop, they should just rename that Adobe. I don't know. Adobe Paint. I think there might be already be an Adobe Painter, <laughs> but uh, you know, um, it was one of those things that like people don't realize. I find Illustrator, some people love it. It's a powerful program. I do find it, as someone who is good in it, I still to this day find it a little counterintuitive. It's very hotkey heavy. You have to know Illustrator hotkeys and key commands. And Illustrator is a very, its AI is very fidgety. It's very stubborn. So you have to tell Illustrator exactly what you want it to do in order for the, um, in order for, you know, the program to work the way you want. Whereas in Photoshop, it's more tactile. You, the commands are, you know, there's, it's a little more easy to get a handle of from point A to point B in the, in the interface wise. Um, so you can see I'm slowly been noodling away here. I've kind of got my teeth in at this point. What I'm doing is I am, uh, let me see. Oh, I'm almost to the end of this. Well, you know what? This is great because, um, so we start seven to eight, eight to nine. So we still have some time. So we'll, we can look at some more maps to wiki art after this, after I'm done with this demo. Um, but yeah, what I'm doing is I, I actually reactivated this paint because it was dry. So I did put a little in linseed oil in this paint at this point. And um, just going in, 
trying to get, I start with a neutral here. I'm starting with a neutral, then I'm going in with a medium around and just getting some shapes and shades in there. And then I'm gonna go in after this and just wet on wet, knock in the highlights. And this part I actually did fairly quick. Right now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm mixing in linseed oil on my palette. And then you see I switched to, I think I switched to a filbert there. Oh no, medium round still. Trying to match up the values in the upper jaw with the values in the lower jaw. Yeah, and this is the fun part. You just noodle away and just draw in shapes. And then if, you know, example, you could keep rendering this in. If I want, if I wanted to make this a little tighter and smoother, I could, but I actually, scales are kind of rough and weird looking. So like, I want it to, to be a little more abstract and brush strokey. Whereas like, if I'm doing human skin, I try to eliminate those hard edges as much as possible. And like, I think faces have that, the thing that makes faces so difficult is that we look at faces all the time and we're, we've evolved to kind of spot features on a face and as humans. And it's the uncanny valley thing where like, you know, if a face looks messed up, you can just tell even if you don't, if, even if you've never drawn, like, especially if you mirror test it, you can tell right away when you flip your drawing in the mirror, if, if an eye is up here and one eye is down there. And I still go through that. Even now, I still, every artist goes through that. They never, if, even the guys who were masters go through that, right? Like the ones who have been painting for years. I'm sure if you asked James Gurney, do you still like draw an asymmetrical face once in a while? He'd probably say, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's very difficult to do symmetry. And that's why when you're doing something like this, you don't do a la prima um, necessarily, at least I don't. I don't wanna worry about the structure of things while I'm trying to get the values and colors correct. I want to have the structure all my underdrawing so I can focus on the painting when I'm painting this. But I think, let's see, I think this is about to go, we're about to go to time. And I think we actually, do we want 34? Yeah, I think it's going to click off here. <laughs> Just put the coup, coup, coup de gras on these teeth in the foreground there. And then um, let's see what else I'm going to, I think I might do some other little tiny bits down here. And yeah, that's that's my uh, stinger. <laughs> and usually it's accompanied by music. So let me stop the share, or actually, let me just get this out of uh, full screen mode. And again, we still have a little bit of time. So let's look at some more artwork, shall we? This gives us a chance to sort of spotlight some of those artists that I didn't spotlight before. And you guys can answer, ask more questions if you're curious. I want to thank those of you who are still with us for hanging in there. and. Uh, uh, spending the evening with us. I uh, do appreciate it. I know that I'm a slow painter, so certain parts are like watching paint dry, I imagine. That was kind of a, <laughs> a joke, right? <laughs> My attempt at a joke, right? Watching paint dry. We left off at Boris Vallejo, right? So, I mean, fantastic draftsman, fantastic figurative artist. And then even, you know, Definitely sort of beautiful women was this thing, pinup women. Um, I never really was into that aspect of his work. I thought like I was more into the guys fighting monsters aspect of it, but his figures are quite beautiful. Like they're beautifully done, beautifully constructed. I think this one has like a very sort of, very sort of dreamlike and surreal. Like look at that wolf. And again, you can see just fantastic command of shadow and value. And like, he was probably, if he wasn't using a Q-tip for some of this, he was using a very, very, very soft round. Um, and maybe a filbert to block stuff in. But again, painting super thin, lean on lean to get these shifts in value. Like there's no impasto here whatsoever. Um, He's building it up here for the highlights, but it's just fairly lean. And then here he's getting more abstract with the wolf. You can see up here at the edge, he's getting more brush strokey. He's drawing a little bit more, describing more with even kind of almost getting into line with the fur, but just uh, fantastic. And then let me show you guys Matt Stawicki. So Matt Stawicki, again, another TSR artist getting back to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, all these guys studied Loomis, they studied Bridgman, 
studied Frazetta, right? So that's the through line. Frazetta, is the, Frazetta and Tolkien is the through line with a lot of these Dungeons and Dragons artists. Mastawiki for me is one of my biggest influences, I think, Todd Lockwood and James Gurney. Um, let me try and find like a, let me try and find like a uh, Mastawiki's Time of the Twins. This is from the Dragonlance Chronicles book. This was done in Photoshop. So that's what I mean when I say Photoshop is just an insanely powerful tool. Like this looks like it was done in oil. I mean, or acrylic possibly, but I mean, this, this, this sky looks like an oil painted sky. And the, the, you know, and he did this back in, I think 2000 or 1999 using Photoshop three. <laughs> it's pretty insane. Um, but I, I bought several copies of these Dragonlance books just for the covers. And I still look at them when I paint and I, uh, you know, I'll, I could be quite obsessive. I'll hold up my paintings. I'll hold the books up next to my paintings to make sure that I'm getting it to a level that I feel like I need to be getting it to. Um, I'll, I'll print out Matt Stawicki's faces and hold his faces up to my faces. I mean, I think it's important to like really shoot, like, you know, have like a standard to shoot for. And I feel like he's a really good standard to shoot for. Like just, um, this is a fantastic image. It's a smaller image. It's pixelated too, but you can still tell. I mean, it looks like a Beauty and the Beast. And Matt, he also worked for Magic the Gathering. Um, he did obviously Dragonlance again, which is the sort of my gateway into the Dungeons and Dragons sort of community. Um, Dragons of Auto Autumn Twilight. We have uh, the character of Tannis. Tannis, Tannis Half Elven. And again, as a kid, I thought, I thought these were, you know, as a 19, 20 year old kid, I just like, I couldn't believe that someone painted this. <laughs> I was like, what? Someone actually painted that? It looks crazy. How is that possible? But now again, 20 years later, I kind of understand like he was just really proficient with the tool and understood light and shadow and value and structure, um, you know. This is, I love all the beautiful autumn colors in this one. And again, um, his dragons were color themed. Each, each cover, you'll notice this has a lot of green in the cover. Um, other paintings that he did, like this has a lot of, this one had a lot of orange and autumn colors. Yeah, so this was this, this is the Dragonlance Chronicles, was the first trilogy of books in the Dragonlance universe. Again, and this was Dungeons and Dragons' first attempt at a franchise back in the late 80s. They had, I think Larry Elmore was the one of the, and uh, Keith Parkinson and um, Clyde Codwell were all the original generation of Dragonlance artists. And then the guys that came right after them, uh, Brom, Mastawiki, and others that I, I, I uh, don't know as much, but I've seen their work, but I don't, I don't know enough to really discuss them. Um, but those are the artists that I like. So this one, definitely like he's focusing on the characters a bit more here. He's getting a little bit more illustrative with the dragon, even even like a little, maybe a little more cartoony, which is fine, but still a great image. A lot of architecture in this one. This was, was a rough one to do. This is rough painting this structure in uh, Photoshop, not to mention oil paint. It's just challenging. There's a lot of perspective going on. And this design probably took him forever. Um, the less architecture you have to deal with, I find it way easier. The, the more organic stuff you have to do and the less inorganic against, against human figures that you need to do, the easier the image is gonna be. Human figures exponentially make the image harder and so does architecture. Let's see, that's Matt Stawicki. It's an older picture of him. Again, he's a little bit older. I think he would be in his mid fifties now, but he was working when I was sort of a kid coming up and get becoming aware of this stuff. Um, that's Tachesis, the dragon goddess. Let's see if we can get a shot. And this is just a pastiche of his different covers. So you have Time of the Twins and another shot of Raceland here. And then you have the, the multiple headed 
Tachesis, the she's sort of like a monster, the main antagonist of Dragonlance. And my D&D, &D, I, I do, I want to make sure that I took notes because I want to make sure I'm accurate with my D&D &D history. Because again, I'm coming at it from just the Dragonlance, you know, being aware of it from that angle. Dragonlance was really my gateway into this, into D&D &D proper. Um, that and magic, because magic acquired TSR in the 90s. Um, let's go to, we've gone over Braun, we've gone over Parkinson. And again, rest in peace, Mr. Keith Parkinson. He uh, unfortunately passed away in 2005 with leukemia. So such a tragedy because he was a fairly young artist. So, but his legacy lives on, right? In his wonderful artwork. So we did Larry Elmore. I think we did Clyde Caldwell. Oh no, let's go to Larry Elmore. I don't think we did Larry Elmore. So Larry Elmore is another, well, I think we might've briefly looked at him, but it's very controlled, sort of similar to Keith Parkinson. I wish I had some shots. I do have some shots of, um, that's a shot of Larry now. You can see he's in his golden years now, and enjoying his retirement, but he still does shows, it looks like. And he's earned it, right? That's probably one of his most famous pieces. This was an iconic piece. Even I remember, I remember this piece being in the comic shop and seeing this painting. Um, yeah, so this was like, again, one of those pieces. This came out in the mid 80s, I think. And it sort of was one of those first pieces that TSR did after the initial first generation of staff, uh, after the initial first generation of staff artists that they hired in the 70s. Um, these guys came in in the 80s and they just elevated it and brought a believability to the creatures that didn't exist before and just a, dy a dynamism and a completeness to the artwork. Um, not to say that the art that was there prior was bad it was just it was less complete in it in as a as a whole it was more you know the art was for D, &D but in this case the art at this point the art is taking center stage and it goes from being for the D, &D universe to sort of being D, D art right with the capital a um and i love the sort of we're not even getting this guy's face but just kind of reminds me of a video game art too there's a video game there's a video game called castlevania which has a the heroes in this sort of pose same sort of heroic pose and then i love all the gold and oranges yeah castlevania castlevania is a great franchise but the original game uh the, i think it was simon belmont the main character is in this pose but he's instead of a sword he's brandishing a whip so um <laughs> and it's a magical whip that can kill vampires <laughs> so you gotta love old school nintendo those are the ideas that they came up with a funny story about castlevania i was at a show carving a pumpkin i was at an event and i was sculpting a pumpkin it was a live sculpting event and this old japanese guy came up to me and he told me that he worked for nintendo america on the original castlevania and he was because i did a castlevania pumpkin i did like but it was based off the netflix show and it was the it was 2019, so it was the year that I think season two came out. And I did like a Trevor Belmont pumpkin, and like he came up and he was like, oh, "I worked on the original game. That's awesome, man." And I was like blown away. I was like, "Oh, that's cool." <laughs> he was just walking the show. I think he he was older. He must have been in his late fifties, early sixties. Who's this? This is Larry Larry Elmore. And this is fantastic work. He works eighteen by twenty four, so he doesn't work terribly big. I mean, neither do I. That's a, that's a tiny image, unfortunately. And again, the other talk I did last year was on Sid Mead, the concept artist for Blade Runner. Uh, Ayami Kojima was clever. Yes. Yeah. You know, and again, I don't know too much about the Castlevania team. I know more about the Mario Brothers um, development team from that time period uh, there's a youtube channel i follow called nintendo video game historian and he goes over 1980s nintendo and all the key people that were involved in the mario franchise and i was sick with, with a bad stomach virus about a month ago and i just put that podcast on and listened to that while i got better 
Because <laughs> each video is like three hours long. They go over the making of Super Mario Brothers World, Mario 3, Mario 2, Mario 1. It was very interesting. This, going back to Frazetta for a moment, was Frazetta's most famous piece. It was called The Death Dealer. And they made a comic book out of this thing. They made a, uh, they're trying to get a movie made, I think. I think the Frazetta estate is trying to get a movie made about this. But the piece is called Death Dealer. And it's basically, you know, a classic revenge story. This guy, it's sort of like the Punisher, right? But if the Punisher existed in the Middle Ages, uh, a farmer loses his, you know, family to an evil Dark Lord. Dark Lord, you know, kills his entire family. And then the farmer ends up swearing revenge he won't rest until he's avenged his family and he gets this magical power and turns into the death dealer so that's sort of the the plot of the death dealer basically in a nutshell sort of the elevator pitch but classic revenge count of monte cristo right sort of revenge story which is uh, count of monte cristo is another great story but just in that sort of tradition right the, the heroes seeks revenge and then at some point turns into the thing that he's fighting against right i guess that's the theme right he realizes it before the end this is the death dealer two i think there's four or five of these in the series and again brahm another D, D artist heavily influenced by frazetta which you could probably see this is death dealer four i, I feel like this is one of my favorite ones that he did because of the movement there's so much movement going on in these pieces. That's him when it's, that's him in the 50s or 60s, I think. Frazetta was a very good-looking guy when he was younger. He was a motorcycle guy. Like he was a, you know, an athlete. Uh, so he definitely, you know, had a, a, you know, his being an athlete and being sort of conventionally handsome, he was able to kind of pose himself for a lot of his stuff. And he was also able to like under have an understanding of like the body and how the body moved is because he came out of being like a, a sportsman. Um, but yeah, let's go. Uh, let's go here. Let's see. Boris, we've done Stowicki, Elmore, Clyde, Todd Lockwood. Let's look at some Todd Lockwood as in the last remaining 10 minutes here. So Todd Lockwood, born in 1957, I think. Um, Another guy a little bit older than Brahm and, and Matt Stowicki, but still sort of in that crop of artists that came in right after Larry Elmore, Clyde Cadwell, and Keith Parkinson. And really, pop, he took what those guys were doing in the 80s with dragons, and he brought it up to another level. Of, like, you can see he's a guy that does a lot of preliminary sketching. And, you know, he takes his paintings to various levels of finish. So it looks like here he's... This could be gouache, could be oil, could be a combination of just a mixed media. It looks like maybe pen, ink, possibly you know gouache or oil on paper, on prime paper. It's hard to tell really with some of these, to be honest, with, with his work. But you can see the anatomy, right? The referencing of the cats, the referencing of mongooses, dogs, like this looks, Looks like he referenced a dog for this particular one. Um, let me do Todd Lockwood Dragons to see if the eponymous image comes up from the from the Atelier Flyer. Yep, it's this one right here. And that's one of his dragons. You can see the anatomy, right? He's he's it's very like it's got a there's a bat's wing, and then it connects directly into the shoulder and kind of goes into the leg. So he's like making up these animals as he goes along. But just incredible doing some nice layering effects here to get like the skin looking really reflective. Just really, really beautiful stuff. Very majestic looking. Kind of also maybe aquatic life. He's looking at some aquatic life. Ah, yes. If Rosetta's luck was, was referenced often by students and staff, I think there were a conference. Yeah, yeah. It's very, it's very. That's true. I mean, Lockwood, again, is someone I discovered late, late in life. I listened to a fantasy art podcast called One Fantastic Week. And they don't, they don't podcast anymore, but they're two very successful fantasy artists on there. And um, they, uh, they, they interviewed Brom. They interviewed Matt Stowicki and Todd Lockwood and all these guys. And I recognized their work from the 90s 
growing up. And so I, I was like, oh, I was able to put a face to a name. And so I looked at his dragons and I thought to myself, I need to be studying this guy and understanding his thought process because he really innately understands creatures. Like I, he would be, he would have fit right in at Disney, this guy. I think, you know, working on a film like The Lion King, like a, who's the guy at Aaron Blaze, I think is the concept artist for Disney that worked on The Lion King. Just again, you can see sort of the way he draws and he's a little bit tighter. Like Gurney is really good at dinosaurs and dragons as well, but Gurney is definitely way looser, way more brush strokey. Um, Talak was just going in and hyper hyper rendering every every little scale which is sometimes you want to do other times you want to be a little more loose i think it depends on the really depends on the dragon like i really like this particular image i actually referenced this i referenced this image for one of my dragons because i like the way lockwood handled the scales he's able to just give a luminosity he really uses the yellow as an illuminant which is something you want to do like never use white always yellow as an illuminant. I know we're at 57, so I'll keep going until um, until they we are we get cut off. <laughs> but uh yeah no this is a fantastic um you know fantastic image. I'm not as crazy about Lockwood's faces, although his faces aren't bad. They're very well done and they look like they're not stitched into the painting. They just get a little do you want to paint money? But I don't know. Maybe it's the poses. I much prefer. Um, I think I'm. I, I really like this dragon though. And this is a good camera. I think maybe it's the helmet. I'm not crazy about that helmet design, but um, this was done in '98. Yeah, yeah. So the final painting finished. I'll show you a shot of um. So I basically just did that dragon head, but I'll show you a shot of it uh, finished. Let me go to, hold on one moment. We're at 58, let me get out of here. I'll show you the section finish that I did. You can see it from far away. You can see how much I still have to go on it. This is gonna be an 80 hour painting that I did, but I'll show you that. Um, Cause I haven't, I'm still painting it. I did, I did that section for this demo, but let me go in. This will also, I, I, I'm gonna throw this up on YouTube too, just so everybody has access to it. But um, yeah, so that's that's basically, no. I don't know if I have that clip of it pulled out, panned out from far away. These are just different clips. Yeah, I don't think I do. Anyway, it is time, but these are just some videos I didn't get to, clips that I felt just didn't go with the flow. But here, you can see the color checker really quick before I zoom in. Let me just, just to see if I, you can see actually here what I'm doing is I'm scraping off. I put it up and I go one to one. And then if that eye is still cockeyed right now. I go back later and I fix that left eye. But basically, you know, that's why I step away generally after I do a painting. I step away and um, I come back 24 hours later to see if I missed anything. And then if some, an eye is off, I go and adjust it at that point. But yeah, that's, the, that's my spiel. That's my story. I'm glad that you guys, seems like you guys had plenty of great questions. I'm glad that... Uh, those of you who stuck with it found it beneficial. Yes, thank you for sticking with me and listening to my dog and pony show. It was really enjoyable to, to be with you guys tonight, talk about painting. I could just talk about this all day. So James, yeah. We, we really thank you for a wonderful talk as always. Um, and uh, I just need to say that uh, the next lecture and demo will be actually it'll be another painting demonstration by Lana Ballett who paints with pastels and it's called Summer Breeze and that'll be July 14th um, so look out for our emails about that and any other events uh, James teaches at the Atelier still because he's in Vermont of course it's it's online yes it's online. check out his classes uh, they're all on our website atelierflowerfield.org 
Um, so if you are interested in learning with James, please do. He is an excellent teacher. Yeah, thank you. We thank you very much, James. That was wonderful. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. And uh, it was nice catching up, Gabby. It was nice, you know, talking to you again. I'm glad everybody down there is doing okay. So yes, uh, indeed. And we all miss you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. Right. Thank I'm you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming on. And uh, this will be up on our website and also on our YouTube channel as well. So you, there are several places you can watch it. Okay. Thank you and, and good night.